kommen mehr unsere Erde. October 8, 2005, in northern Pakistan, in the capital city of Islamabad, a massive earthquake rips through the Margala Towers in one of the city's wealthiest areas. Inside, all hell is breaking loose. In her ground floor apartment, Khalida Begum struggles to hustle her elderly mother out of harm's way. I held her hand and brought her to the corridor. Residents stampede for the exits as the building begins to collapse around them. After taking a few steps, things started to fall on us. Then the ground suddenly opened up and we fell into it. One floor above, May Amin and her family are desperately trying to escape. But the earthquake's force is swift and deadly. In less than a minute, the seismic monster has wiped out three of the Margala Towers. The residents who couldn't escape in time were instantly entombed. Hello, John Holland. More than 6,000 kilometers away in the middle of the night, John Holland gets the call. He leads one of the world's top disaster response teams, a highly trained group of search and rescue volunteers known as Rapid UK. When I turned on the, the TV, you could see aerial pictures of, of villages and towns that have been totally destroyed. And the most dramatic pictures that were coming back were of the Magella Towers in Islamabad. Holland learns that the earthquake, measuring 7.6 on the Richter scale, has crippled much of northern Pakistan and Kashmir, along with parts of India and Afghanistan. It's one of the worst natural disasters okay. in Pakistan's yeah. history. Hold, hold on a minute, will you? We would welcome assistance from friends all over the world. We are uh, in the process now of uh, sizing up the damage. OK, yeah, I'm on the way. Nearly 1,200 kilos of special high-tech equipment are loaded for the mission. Okay. Everything from stretchers and rescue packs to high-tech searching devices like thermal imagers and vibraphones. At the Margala Towers in Islamabad, there is an urgent need for well-trained rescuers. Hundreds of people lived in these buildings. Nobody knows how many of them made it out alive. One of the people searching for loved ones is 34-year-old Mamoon Tariq Khan. He lived in one of the adjoining towers that withstood the quake. Several members of his extended family lived in one of the towers that collapsed. I'll be honest, when, uh, when I just looked at the rubble, 11 flights all down to just a floor and a half. It started setting in as to what could have happened to my own family. I was the only one, you know, of my immediate family alive. As Mamoon searches for four generations of his family, his thoughts drift to happier times. Mamoon's sister and her young son were inside one of the collapsed towers. Also missing, his 76-year-old grandmother and his 56-year-old mother, Khalida. Next time, why not bring the refrigerator? It's easier to carry. <laughs> During this, this state of intense loss, I heard my sister's voice. I turned around, she was holding her baby in her arms. Mamoon's sister and her son narrowly escaped before the tower collapsed. The very next thing was, you know, where's mom and grandma? 
And she says they're right behind me. Mamoon and others who gather at the site struggle to stay positive, but faced with such destruction, it's hard to keep the faith. Even the most optimistic would find it hard to believe that under thousands of tons of rubble, the weight of 10 collapsed floors, Mamoon's mother and grandmother are still alive. They are trapped in a tiny, hollow space. If the mountain of rubble shifts even slightly, it will crush them. I thought it was the end of the world. I was thinking that only my mother and I had survived and everyone else had died. Khalida's mother, Ma Bibi, is barely alive. She has a deep head wound that will not stop bleeding. I was very worried about my mom since she was not in good shape. She was vomiting and I could smell blood. I was expecting death at any time. John Holland and his disaster response team have arrived in Pakistan. We were met at the airport by the British, British Embassy, uh, Pakistan government officials, the military, the police. Um, and because we were the first international rescue team there, everybody wanted us. Holland and an assessment team head straight to the Magala Towers. He evaluates the damage while other Rapid UK members load equipment back at the airport. The size of the buildings immediately said to me, these people need specialised equipment. They need specialised teams in there. Holland asks the rest of his team to move as quickly as possible to the Margala Towers. The rescuers face a volatile situation. A large crowd of onlookers hover helplessly, desperate for quick results, some kind of sign that family members are alive. Why don't you help us instead of pushing us around? I saw the rebel. I was all, you know, on top of them. But knowing that it's going to be a while, it was a terrible feeling to know that they were not the priority right then. Um, and I could not make them the priority either. Because he's accompanied by officials, Holland is rushed through the crowd. But he knows all too well that in an earthquake, roughly 90% of the people saved are dug out within the first 24 hours. Holland also realizes that aftershocks from the quake can shift the rubble, killing those who are trapped and those trying to save them. Most of the Rapid UK team arrives and kicks into action. While some of them set up a base camp and communication centre, another group starts searching right away. Anthony, uh, can you put it near the generator, I think? One of the members is Gillian Dacey, the team's medic. Like all Rapid UK members, she is specially trained. And that includes basic search, basic rescue, um, working at heights, uh, logistics, security, uh, base camp issues, communications. The mission has been meticulously planned. Nothing has been left to chance. The camp is fully equipped. We're a self-sufficient team, so we take out our own uh, food, which is um, sort of pre-packaged sealed ration packs. Uh, we take an amount of, a small amount of water to start us off until we find a local supply. We take all our own search equipment, uh, rescue equipment, take our own um, toilet equipment so we're not a burden on the, on the local people or environment. At the heart of the operation is a state-of-the-art communication hub. Check. 
Check. Can you read John over? Satellite phones as part of the communications equipment, along with uh, com computers, um, broadband internet access, and we've got our own radio communications on site as well in between team members and, and the base camp. Check. The team gears up to start searching the surface of the rubble. Proceed to site for surface search. Over. Roger, over and out. Come on, we're up, everybody. There are enough provisions at the camp for a 10-day mission. Under the rubble, time is running out. Kalita listens helplessly as her mother moans and grows weaker by the hour. Here, put this against your head. It'll stop the bleeding, I mean. I was happy that I was with my mom. It was good that she was with me. I was trying my best to comfort her. I knew that we couldn't get out without the help of God. John Holland and his team need to take control of the noisy and crowded disaster site. Before we can start search and rescue operations, the first thing we have to do is clear the rubble. And we're looking at thousands of people on and around the rubble. Asking people to leave the rubble when they've got um, families missing, relatives, friends, neighbors, it is a very hard job to do. And it's certainly not one I like doing, but it has to be done. I, I stayed uh, right next to where the action was for most of the time. I yelled at the administration, I fought with them, and uh, even then, I just couldn't change uh, the pace at which you know, people were being pulled out. The problem is that the noise of the rescuers above ground can drown out sound coming from deep inside the rubble. In the beginning, we could hear the drilling of machines and the sirens from the ambulances. Across the site, operators are ordered to turn off their machines. Then the drilling stopped. I thought they'd ended the search because they thought that no one else was alive. The search area is huge, roughly the size of a soccer field. So the team's next challenge is simply where to start. By hand, it's going to take way too long to reach him in any reason. To identify the best area to search, the team studies a blueprint of the towers. Next, they consult a missing persons list. Literally inch by inch until we can... So then we were able to match up the flat numbers and where we thought that people might be. In the process, Holland and his team learn that between 70 and 120 residents of the building are still missing. But despite all the maps and the missing persons list, the team's best clues to pinpoint a primary search area come from local residents. Yeah, OK. That previous night, somebody had heard voices. Whether that was true or not, we're not sure. However, you've got to start somewhere, and we based it on information. Hello? Can anybody hear me? Hello, is there anybody here? The team begins a sweep of the top of the collapse to see if anyone is buried just beneath the surface and survived the impact. Okay, be careful, move slowly. Hello, can anybody hear me? When you carry out calling and listening uh, search, you're, you're not necessarily looking for people just underneath the surface. Um, they, they could be a few meters down, basically within listening distance. Is anybody there? Kalida and her mother are buried so deeply, they hear nothing. It was very scary. We were so buried that we couldn't hear anyone from the outside, and no one from the outside could hear us. But on the surface, there's a breakthrough. OK, everybody over here. Do you have any injuries? After just 45 minutes, the rescuers find their first survivor. We had actually located a 14-year-old male who, who could be heard below the rubble. Great. The boy has a leg injury, but is otherwise unharmed. We need uh, stretchers, crowbars, hammers. Already the team has living proof that their efforts are paying off. Well yeah, the feeling of finding a survivor so quickly after arriving on scene, you think, wow, that is just the most fantastic thing. That's good, guys. Very slowly. Only 15 minutes later, they hear another voice. 
John, I think we've got a voice here. This time, it's a woman. Coming over, Julia. She was only about two metres down, but there was a huge slab of concrete um, from the floor above, literally pushed against her face. All these people have been standing on her, on top of her, and uh, she was very seriously trapped, very seriously injured. So we had two simultaneous rescues going on. We'll get you out as soon as we can, all right? No one was pulled out. Um, that was as far down as, as, you know, my own family was. Um, so as, you know, elated as I was that someone else has been pulled out alive, um, that did not, you know, raise my hopes for my own family. First thing we did was to try and clear the dust away from her face. So she'd been covered in this, this sort of really suffocating type of dust for, for a day and a half. Relax, stay calm. Use it too there. All available to us. In less than an hour, they pulled the teenaged boy from the rubble. but it takes a full six hours to free the woman from under the concrete slab. One of her legs will have to be amputated, but she will recover. For the Rapid UK team, it's a very good start. But he's had a break, we can... Uh... Yeah, terrific, that's great. Because you suddenly think, we've got two people here. By just doing what we class as a surface search, how many more are alive? inside this building. That, that spurs you on, it spurred, spurred the whole team on. Later that day, the rescuers find a third survivor near the surface. Then the search goes cold. I was remembering those moments just before the earthquake and I was thinking what a good moment it was. I was asking Allah to keep my kids alive. I was asking this of Allah all the time. For the time being, Khalida's mother has stabilized and has stopped vomiting blood. The hope was all but gone at this point in time. They hadn't found someone for, for a good 10 hours, I think. I clearly realized that, you know, it was hard for them to survive 11 flights falling on them. For the Rapid UK team, it's time to switch strategy, to move deeper into the rubble in search of air pockets that might contain survivors. It's hard to believe that anyone trapped in lower level apartments, like Khalida and her mother, can survive such a devastating earthquake. But non-collapsible objects like sturdy couches, stoves and filing cabinets are capable of bearing the weight of a collapse. These objects can also create air pockets and hollows known as voids. It's in these spaces that survivors might be found. It can be the pockets that form from the collapsed roof, or it can be stairwells, uh, lift shafts, um, anywhere we've got where we think there's a space. You could see voids from the outside. Um, so if you can see voids from the outside, then it's fairly guaranteed that there's going to be voids on the inside. I guess it's, it comes down to where you are in the building at the time. Um, and a, a bit of luck. If you happen to be standing in, in the place, it's going to form a void when the building collapses. I mean, that, that's fantastic. But if, if, if you're trapped in, a, in an area, if you're trapped under a beam, then, then yeah, there's, there's no chance. To hear survivors in the deepest voids, rescuers need special listening equipment. OK, let's get the probes down, boys. Ready? What we use for the sound location is, is what we call a vibraphone, and that works on uh, seismic and acoustic sounds. And it's basically three probes uh, with a control box. Very, very sensitive equipment, and you place it on the rubble or down into voids. All work, stop! Silence! Baton strike! 
and you tap, you bang to people, and what you're looking for or listening for is a response of some of some kind. Bat and strike! The sound of the hammer travels deep into the pile of rubble. The team hopes that any survivor below who hears it will shout or bang back a message. From the depths of the disaster site, a human voice rises to the surface. One of the team members um, who was on the headsets said that he could, he thought he could hear a voice. So I took over the headphones and uh, listened intensely. We, we banged, we called. Please! And every time we banged and we called out, I could hear uh, yeah. A very, very faint lady's voice. Very faint. OK, we definitely got something. Let's go again. Silence! Bat and strike! <laughs> she was very deeply buried. And uh, she was... She sounded very, very desperate. Trapped deep beneath the rubble is 33-year-old May Amin. The quake has separated May and her baby from her husband Firas, a United Nations employee, and their oldest son, Hussein. May has broken her back and one of her legs. She cannot move her lower body at all. But for the rescuers, the question remains, where is she? She was a long way down and we had thousands and thousands of tons of rubble. I mean, the first thing that, that really went through my mind, um, to be honest, was how the hell are we going to get to her? Stu, keep this probe here. They try for a stronger signal, one that will help them better pinpoint her location. Let me know when you're ready, boys. We tried going down the face of the rubble, literally each layer, calling in. Hello? Can anybody? But we couldn't get a better contact at all. If we could get a stronger signal, just say halfway down the rubble, then we could say she's in that area. And there's different techniques of placing these probes to try and narrow down the possible search area. But it is a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. They are unable to get a stronger signal. Then suddenly, the signal disappears altogether. We called, there was, there was no answer, and we thought, well, what sort of happened? We thought, you know, it's taken this long. Why, why did the voice go away? Why did we lose contact with her? What have we done to, to have lost contact with her? And that really did affect all of us, I think, in, in some way or other. More than 30 hours have passed since the quake. What the rescuers don't know is that May Amin's two-year-old son, Abbas, is also trapped in the rubble. Another rescue team brings in dogs specially trained to find earthquake survivors. But because the bodies are buried so deeply, the dogs are unable to pick up their scent. Yes, that's it. It's perfect. It's working. Lower away. The Rapid UK team turns to another high-tech search tool. It's a special fiber optic probe designed to twist and bend around rocks and other obstacles. 
fiber optic probe is, is known as a snake eye. It's a, a camera uh, on a basically on a on a cable and a, and a pole, and it gives you an image of basically what you can see. It's in color, has its own light source, and uh, you have a control box which basically shows the image whatever it's looking at. But yet again, no signs of life. Now the team searches for invisible clues using an instrument able to detect the carbon dioxide signature of human breath. It's basically a probe um, with a control box, an analyzer, and you're pushing the probe into voids areas again, and you're looking for uh, CO2 emissions uh, from the exhaled breath of a person that's still alive. But yet again, the rescuers come up empty. For John Holland and the others, Maya Mean's voice, reaching out from deep under the earth, continues to haunt them. There was, there was no point, no point whatsoever that I thought about stopping the search for her. Because in my mind, she was alive. We were not going to, to give up on her because you'd have regretted that for the rest of your life. So that was never an option. In order to continue the search, they have to resort to a riskier method, digging machines. We took a look at the map of the building and we, we made an educated guess of where would be the most appropriate place to start digging in. Back at the camp, John Holland gets an unexpected break. Zone two to base. Zone two to base. Zone two base here. Go ahead. I was called on the radio to come back because uh, a small void had been exposed that looked like it went further into the rubble. The void is so small that only one person can enter at a time. And we could only get in uh, um, probably about a metre and a half at this stage because it was just so small. I managed to get um, top half of my body in because I'm, I'm quite a, a small guy, so I can get in there. Is there anybody here? Can you hear my voice? Called out, and uh, amazingly, she, she called back. And uh, I knew straight away it was the same voice. Suddenly, Maya Mean's voice is coming in loud and clear. She must be close by. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And that was a huge, huge lift for the team. But then it all starts again. Exactly where is she? Now the hell are we going to get her out? Holland burrows through the ground toward the voice. Lined with broken debris, the tunnel is too small to bring in disc cutters and chainsaws. A lot of the rescues come down to using your bare hands and small tools, which is back-breaking work and... and, and Obviously, it lengthens the rescue. Everywhere around him is the reminder of death. You don't think about them at the time. You know they're there. You try and cover them up. You try and put them out of your mind. We knew that this is day three, well into day three, and uh, this person's going to get going to be very, very weak. Um, they may be injured. So it, it, it is a race against time. Moving anything in or out of the tunnel requires slow and laborious teamwork. To make his way toward the voice, Holland and his team must clear a path through heavily compressed debris. Holland has moved three metres into the tunnel. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you. My name is May. May Amin. Please. It is important to reconnect with May. After passing out, she regains consciousness and must fight to stay alive.
Just past the the, the um, TV um, was a was a picture on the floor, um, and it was all smashed, and it was a wedding photograph. May Amin is now only centimeters away, but Holland is blocked by a large concrete beam, and now he makes a horrific discovery. Cleared away the rubble and the rubbish, which exposed uh, a body, which was. Um, which was a male, and uh, he was uh, he was crushed underneath the beam, partially his, his head, um, shoulders um, were underneath the beam. I, I couldn't figure it out why um, he had a small arm. It wasn't his arm; it was a child's arm. I mean, we quickly worked out that it was May's husband and and her other son. May's husband died trying to save their seven-year-old son, Hussein. The child is still locked in his father's arms. That beam, in fact, that gave us safety and protection and gave May probably safety and protection, took the life of her husband and her child because they were underneath it. Holland is shocked when May tells him that she can hear her son. And then I said, um, what's your son's name? And she told me, it's Abbas. I said, call out his name, May. And uh, he called back. Unbelievable. This is a, a real race against time now, because we've got a young child here that's been buried for three days. May, can you hear this? <laughs> Jeff, I can hear you! You are very close! <clears throat> but not close enough. The beam is too heavy to move or cut. They must get a better idea of May's location. Can you see the light? I can see you. The team needs to come up with a different plan. After withdrawing from the void, um, I spoke to other team members and we had to basically find a way in on the other side of this beam. 12 meters away and even deeper in the rubble, Kalida and her mother are still hanging on, but barely. I was asking God, that if my children had survived, then to save me too. But if, God forbid, my children were dead, then not to let me get out alive. Let me die too. Rapid UK is busy digging a new tunnel to get to May Amin. This one is even tighter than the last. Again, was with hand, hands, just clearing the rubble out with hands and then chopping up the table, was a table in there. So getting rid of that with a saw working in, a, in, a, in an area that you, 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 you can't turn, you can hardly turn your head, um, is very, very hard. They are stopped dead by an iron bar 40 millimetres thick. We had equipment that would have cut it, um, but we couldn't get it in there. Instead, they bring in a hydraulic pump connected to a small jack. The jack raises the bar that they can't move by hand just barely enough for a team member to squeeze through. Team member Paul Worcester is the first through. Hold on, May. Just stay calm. We'll be with you very, very soon. Moving through the dark void, Worcester comes face to face with May's younger son, Abbas. Once he got that chair away, uh, Abbas came towards him, crawled, actually crawled over him. Come on, Abbas. Yeah, that's great. Come on, this way. Now Holland crawls backwards all the way out of the tunnel, holding the tiny survivor. Miraculously, the boy has no major injuries. Him crawling up towards me with my light shining in his eyes, well, I'll always remember that.
The badly injured May needs medical attention urgently. Initial um, information that had come out from her was that she had um, pain in her back and her legs and that she might have been trapped in some way, which immediately to us was starting to ring alarm bells in terms of medically just how that was going to affect her if we started to move her. Because of those injuries, Gillian Dacey, the team medic, is sent in. Off and put it on the end of the bed to generally light up the area. Daisy reaches May and spots May's dead husband and son just centimeters away. At the time, you just um, you focus. You've, you've got to focus on the on the job in hand, and and I guess I didn't didn't I tried not to think too much about it. I don't believe that May had any idea that they were there because she was in a dark, um, a dark room, dark void. I don't think she had any, I hope she didn't have any idea at the time. Can you move at all? Daisy learns that May can't move her legs at all. Okay. okay. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, ideally to, to treat her for those sort of injuries, I need, I need certain spinal stretches and I need all sorts of things, but Realistically, in, in that environment, I knew that that was was not going to be an option. We're not going to get a stretcher in it. We're going to need a drag sheet. Can you get me a drag sheet? Since May is unable to get out on her own, the only solution is to drag her out. Right, I've got it. And the most simple tool was to get a what we call a carry sheet or a drag sheet, which is basically a, a piece of a, a sort of heavy, durable canvas with um, carry handles, sort of canvas loops sewn onto the side of it. Okay. And so that was passed down the tunnel to me. OK, we're ready to go. Pull. And I know that that caused her some discomfort on the way out. But she was, she was very, very good about not complaining about it. Slowly, May is dragged out of the void, where she's been trapped for the last three days. But she must still clear the metal bar that blocks the exit. It's difficult for us to get under it and we're trained to get under those small things, but she was lying there, gripping hold of this canvas carry sheet, and then we we're about to pull her into a, through a small 10-inch sort of hole or space to get her out. Okay, well, Nearly 60 hours after she was buried, the rescue team has saved May Amin and her son from certain death. This m massive roar and cheering just goes up, and, uh, and people shouting, it's like, well, wow, this is amazing. The whole scene had, had really changed from when I went in. I, I had no idea of time when I went in, how long I was in there for. And when I came out and stood up, the spotlights were on. It was like being in, in a theatre, really. And it was a really surreal sort of feeling. And I just burst into tears. People say, you know, that must have been a really exciting experience or you must have been elated when they come out. No, really. Because you're, you're pleased that you've rescued them alive, but they've lost two members of their family. John Holland and the Rapid UK team continue their methodical search of the collapsed Margala Towers. Certainly every day that passes, the chances of survival are diminishing. And in fact, you know, after, after day four normally, day three or four, you're looking for a miracle, absolute miracle. Zone two, go ahead. Oh, we've got a voice back here, sir. I was back at base camp and I had a radio message can I come to uh, Zone 4? We think we may have something. They hear a voice coming from an area at the very base of the rubble, ten storeys down. The location makes access from the top or sides of the rubble pile impossible. Waiting on the reaping in any reasonable time. 
because the area next to it, the flats up to it, this building is still standing, and so we cannot get any machinery in there. So There's only one solution. The only way to get at it was, was from underneath the adjoining tower from their underground garage. Starting from the underground parking lot in the adjoining building, the rescue team works its way to the survivors. The first thing we had to do was remove all the rubble. Um, the guesstimate was that um, there's about 20 tonnes. Using a concrete breaker in such a confined space is so difficult that rescuers can only work in 20-minute shifts. In fact, one, one guy had to lay um, holding it across his body while the other one operated it because it was impossible to use. After hours of back-breaking work, they finally make contact. Can anybody hear me down here? Mommy. The voice they hear belongs to Kalida. She and her mother are very close to death. They sahar bande, chima help the para, madad the para, chia la madad. On the fourth day, when I called for help, I heard voices coming from the outside. I didn't know if it was someone who wanted to help us or someone who was trapped and needed help. They gave us their ages, so we knew that one of the ladies um, was quite, quite an elderly lady and that um, she's going to be very weak. The discovery of a survivor ripples through the crowd. We try not to tell people um, until we're positive we've got someone and that we can get them out because it builds up hope for people falsely. Do they know their name? Is it a woman? There was a point, you know, two days into it where um, I'd seen enough dead bodies come out. I had uh, made arrangements for two coffins. Over the next 16 hours, more than 20 tons are moved out by hand. The rescue team works through meters of bars, pipes, and cable. Along the way, death is everywhere. When Kalida and Ma are found, they have been trapped for 70 hours in a 30 centimeter high void. Shone a torch down the tunnel, a powerful torch and asked if she could see it, and she could. <laughs> and literally just, you could just see a part of her with her, with her hand moving. Oh, but suddenly, they realize that Kalida does not want to be rescued. When the light reached us, I got worried since I knew they were going to rescue me and I would be informed about my children. Without my children, my life has no meaning to me. My children are my life. If my children are not alive, I do not want life for myself. She is fine, she's all right, but she's very distressed and she really needs to know that you and you just turn around for to prove that the rest of Kalida's family made it out alive, her son Mamoon is brought to the tunnel. I put my head into a hole and uh, yelled out, and my mother, I heard her very clearly. We're all okay, Mom. Just wait for them to come and get you, okay? They're coming, Mom. The love that our mother had for us, uh, that was clear that day, if not before, and it was that day. Because they are so deep in the rubble, it takes most of the day to pull Kalida and her mother up to safety. Against all odds, they have survived nearly 83 hours in a rat hole. Those gathered at the site allow themselves a brief moment of joy. It was uh, destiny, fate, luck, chance, coincidence, whatever you may call it. Um, the facts were entirely against these two coming out alive. I'd like to thank the great people of Rapid UK. We got lucky in the immediate sense when it comes to our family, but uh, those uh, three days um, made us realize um, just as much how much loss um, had occurred from this earthquake. 
The massive earthquake killed nearly 74,000 people and left more than two and a half million homeless. At the Margala Towers site, Rapid UK was able to save seven people from the rubble. To go out and, and to, to, to pull people out of, of a building where they may not have been able to have much chance of surviving, it's, it's a huge rewarding. Give us a chance, and if there's people there alive, we will find them. A lot of credit must go to the local people that helped and supported us as well. The search continued for a week, but no other tenants from these buildings were found alive. Scores of people lost their lives in the Margala Towers. Etched in stone are the victims' names, including May Amin's husband and her son. May Amin recovered from her injuries. She currently lives in Iraq, along with her surviving son, Abbas. I reflect on that and I think, OK, they're alive. But she's got to build her life again, and uh, that's not easy when you've lost your, your husband and, and one of your children. Today, what's left of the Margala Towers still stands, but the complex is condemned and slated to be demolished. Those who designed and built the Margala Towers have been charged with criminal negligence. Mamoon and others who survived believe that if the building had been properly constructed, dozens of people would still be alive today. It was a ticking bomb, but we never knew about it until it fell. <laughs>